Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House, taking a look at some of the pistols that they are going to be selling in their upcoming Spring or April of 2017 Firearms Auction. Today we're taking a look at a high standard military trials pistol. So the, the story on this thing is that in 1947 the US Army Air Force decided that it didn't really want to use the 1911. They were looking for a new pistol that would be used both by pilots and folks on the ground, but they wanted something that was a little lighter and a little more compact. Part of the idea here was the pistol had to fit in part of the, the air crew survival vest, and a 1911 was big and heavy. Um, in fact, they were actually briefly considering looking at a pistol that had a folding grip in order to reduce bulk. They didn't end up going with that idea, but they did uh, put out a, a request for a pistol that would be less than 25 ounces, less than 7 inches long, and hold 7 to 10 rounds of ammunition. And they were looking at between 30 and 35 caliber. They ended up with 9 millimeter, not surprisingly, that's kind of the obvious caliber choice to go to. A bunch of gun companies expressed an interest, and two of them ended up with contracts to develop prototypes. One was Colt, and the other was High Standard. This is one of High Standard's pistols. Now the first batch of guns were delivered in 1948, and they were single stack guns in 9mm, uh, aluminum frames to reduce recoil, and the Ordnance Department, or the Army Air Force, had actually specifically said that they were willing to look at either locked breech or simple blowback actions. In fact, in some uh, correspondence, the Army Air Force officer involved in the program actually specifically cited a couple of existing 9mm pistols that were not locked breech actions as proof that you could in fact do a blowback 9mm. Uh, specifically, he referenced the Beretta model of 1923, the Astra model of 400, and the Walther MP. So kind of some pretty esoteric stuff there to be referencing. At any rate, High Standard went ahead and did this as a straight blowback pistol. And their first batch of guns didn't work all that well. They had a lot of uh, malfunctions, a lot of problems. They went back, and in 1949 they produced a second series of guns. This is one of the ones from the second series. Now they only produced four. The serial numbers were 21, 22, 23, and 4. They had actually produced four of the first pattern guns as well, which were serial numbered 1 through 4. And I expect the, the reason for the jump in the serial numbers on the second series was that they were it was basically a two-part number. It was series 2, number 1, series 2, number 2, i.e. 22, and so on. Now the fourth pistol, uh, the first three were sent to the military for trials, and the fourth one was held back at the factory. Same thing happened with the first series. And this is that fourth pistol that never went through military testing specifically. Now the difference with this second pattern of gun was that they were uh, double stack instead of single stack, and they were designed to use Browning high power magazines. In addition, High Standard had come up with this really slick way to make, to basically turn this into a delayed blowback gun. And in fact, what's really interesting to me is that this system was patented by a guy named Otto von Losnitzer, who, as it happens, had been technical director for Mauser all the way through World War II. He was a brilliant engineer, fantastic, very interesting gun guy, and he actually emigrated to the United States, or was brought over to the United States after the war, where he spent the rest of his career working with U.S. ordnance. And in this case, he was working for High Standard. And the patent for this system is actually in his name. He actually wrote a memoir which was published not that long ago. I don't think it's a pretty niche book, but it is out there if you're interested in it. Anyway, what he came up with was the idea to inscribe two annular rings in the back of the chamber. And the, the brass case, when it fired, would expand into these rings, and that would kind of jam the case into the chamber. And the pressure from firing would have to overcome that and squeeze the case back out over those rings before it could extract. And this slowed down extraction and ejection of the case. It was a really good idea, and the US Air Force didn't like it. They just wanted standard, regular, blowback pistol. So with this second batch of guns, High Standard actually they, they sent three guns to the Air Force for testing, as requested, and they had standard chambers, but they actually sent three additional duplicate barrels with this annular chamber uh, cut to them. And they requested, in fact the, the Air Force documentation mentioned specifically that High Standard was really trying to push this idea of this delayed ring chamber idea 
And that's why they sent the extra barrels, hoping that they would both be tested against each other. Well, it turns out, I don't think they did much testing with the ringed barrels, because uh, the guns all had substantial problems, they just weren't all that reliable, and they had some issues with parts breaking, primarily the hammers broke, they weren't quite made right. And at the end of the testing cycle, they realized that the frames were not in great shape. Um, there was a third series of guns that was also produced which would have these same problems. The third series actually went back to single stack. Not entirely sure why, probably to try and make a stronger frame. The frames of all these guns are simple aluminum, or aluminum alloy. And they found, after the end of testing series, they were found to be battered, cracked, they just couldn't handle the slide velocity from an unlocked, just blowback 9mm pistol. The slide was going too fast, it was battering the frames. These weren't, did not end up being successful pistols. And by 1953, the whole program was cancelled. Um, High Standard was paid for all their work, they were deemed to have done exactly what the Air Force asked them, but the idea behind the pistol just didn't work out. They weren't able to make them successful, and so the Air Force went on using 1911s instead. Now this one is a bit unusual in that it has a muzzle brake fixed to the slide here. In, normally you'd have something like that fixed to the frame, in this case it's on the slide. Let's take a closer look at that. So there are no high standard markings of any sort on here. In fact, there's only one marking on it at all, and that is the serial number right here on the butt. Uh, it is number 4, which is a little bit unusual, in that the other three were 21, 22, and 23. But uh, presumably the other numbers were done for the convenience of the Army personnel, or the Air Force personnel, uh, who already had guns numbered 1, 2, and 3. Uh, this other mark right here, that's a J.I. That is because this pistol is using a Browning High Power magazine that was made by the John Inglis Company in Canada. Uh, as part of the development for this pistol, High Standard actually got its hands on some Inglis magazines and an Inglis High Power pistol to do some R&D on. As part of their procurement uh, request, the Air Force did recognize that this uh, new Air Force pistol would have to see service in some pretty extreme climates. And so one of the things they specifically required was that it had to be shootable with or without gloves. And High Standard's approach to making that happen was to have a folding trigger guard. So we have a spring-loaded button right here, and we can lift the trigger guard forward and lock it in place up here at the front of the frame, thus leaving you with a pistol that can be easily fired with a big gloved hand. This is double and single action. And the double action trigger pull is remarkably smooth. Uh, the Air Force actually required it to be no more than four and a half pounds double action. Disassembly is very easy. This is the disassembly catch, and what we need to do is just pull the slide back to, let's see, right about there. Where is it? There it is. Pull the slide back to there. We rotate this catch all the way around, and then the slide comes off the front of the gun, after I take the magazine out, of course. So the barrel is fixed into the frame. This is a simple blowback action, and normally you'd be able to push this forward and pull the barrel out, except that there is this muzzle brake that's integral to the front of the slide, and that is really stiff in place. What you'd have to do is tap this muzzle brake down while you were taking the barrel out, and I don't want to get out the, the hammer and tap set to deal with that on this pistol, because you can see exactly what it's doing. Um, there is there are a pair of ports on the barrel that line up with these two uh, muzzle brake baffles. It's a little interesting why they would put that on there. Um, it almost seems as if it would help accelerate the slide backwards, because this is fixed to the slide. Normally you'd expect the muzzle brake to be fixed to the frame so that it didn't move. Um, if this does accelerate the slide, that would explain why they didn't ever make more than one, because making the slide go faster is exactly what you wouldn't want to do on this pistol. It had enough problems with slide velocity to begin with. It's also interesting to note here how much of the case would be exposed. The barrel's fully seated, and we have a fairly large gap. That's three or four millimeters. Um, of space between the breech face and where the chamber starts. So that's a, a very large unsupported area, and I'm not sure exactly 
they had some prototype ammunition that was trialed in these pistols, and I suspect that is uh, a barrel made for a non-standard cartridge right there. Other than that, the gun's pretty standard. Um, does have a very nice lightweight aluminum frame. The <laughs> disassembly lever does come out. Um, they did have to leave the, the sear connector exposed slightly, because they, they mentioned this in some of the documentation. The frame ended up being very wide to get around a double stack magazine, uh, much more so than on the early single stack versions of the gun. But double action hammer system, we have an ejector here. Like I said, the rest of the gun's pretty typical. The magazine release button is here on the side. This was also changed. It's there on the second pattern guns. On the first series, uh, the magazine release was actually in the heel. There you go. One disassembled high standard T3 automatic pistol. The number of connections in this gun is really fantastic to me. So at high standard, uh, the head of the design team was a guy named Robert Hilberg, who developed a bunch of other interesting guns in the post-World War II era. Uh, he developed the Liberator shotguns, which we have a video on, um, which are neat. Uh, he had a develop- he had a- actually not just post-World War II, he developed one of the prototypes um, in the M1 carbine trials program, and a bunch of other stuff. His lead designer on this specific project for the T3 here was a guy named George Wilson, uh, who was also a talented designer. If you've watched a lot of the back videos on this channel, you may have seen the video on the Wilson 45 target pistol. Only three of those were manufactured, and George Wilson was a competitive target shooter and designed himself a pistol specifically for that uh, type of competition. We have a video on one of those, too. That's a really cool pistol. Of course, we have Otto von Lusnitzer patenting the, uh, the delaying mechanism, and of course, as R&D director for Mauser, he was involved with a great many interesting German projects through the war, both small arms and large arms. A lot of aircraft cannon work was being done at Mauser. Just a ton of connections in the gun world um, that all come back circling around this particular pistol. Now, if you'd like to have it, add it to your own collection. Take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to the Julia catalog page for this guy. Uh, you can take a look at their pictures and description, and there is some documentation that also comes with this that's in of interest. And uh, if you'd like to place a bid on it, you can do that directly through their website, or you can come here and participate live in the auction. Thanks for watching.